Okay. <clears throat> um, just before I get started, uh, I've I've, uh, <laughs> I've just done a large update on my Mac, and I've had some audio trouble. So if there's a problem with the audio, just let me know. Um, I've had problems with the microphone dropping out suddenly for no apparent reason. Uh, but we'll give it a go, and we'll see how we get on. Uh, I did I did a test yesterday, and the mic seemed to be working okay. Um, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, uh, let's just very quickly recap where we were. Uh, we have this machine. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to step outside it. Uh, oh good okay uh, thanks for letting me know um, we'll, we'll see how we get on um, like I said I, I can actually see a, an audio meter here and it seems to be working okay but I have had weird dropouts and I don't know why uh, but I, th I think I've fixed it we'll see okay so recap uh, yes, we'd set up a, a virtual machine um, and we'd started writing uh, various files. Um, oh, hang on a minute. Uh, set up a lab. Uh, I'll post here. Okay. Uh, bootstrap script coming with XQ inside of the app. Yep. Docker image pools need for concourse were extremely slow. Oh! I changed the Docker shell to download the latest version. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yep. Okay, excellent. Well, it's, I mean, it, uh, the good news uh, is that you've managed to sort it out yourself, Pavzar. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Uh, in fact, uh, shall we just make that change to Docker? Well, let me let me work through this because there are, there are several changes we need to make. Um, so let's let's just work our way through. Uh, so uh, just a quick recap then. So what we've got is we've got this vagrant file. Uh, okay, uh, and it's a very simple wee beastie. Now, as we as I explained uh, last time. Uh, because I already have something running on port 9080, I've had to change this to 9081. Uh, and inside the script, uh, I've had to make a change to the concourse Docker Compose, which again, I will show once I get in there. Uh, so one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to fix that so that this change here to this concourse port variable uh, will be passed properly into the, um, the setup on the actual virtual machine. So I don't have to edit it in two places, which is always tricky. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at these scripts. Now, perhaps you've already pointed out that there are it, there's an issue with the Docker one. Um, th there are also issues with, uh, w well, with all the scripts, um, but we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through those. Uh, so we'll tidy that up. We'll also tighten this up somewhat because uh, at the moment th this is all a bit, it just feels a bit random. Okay, so we'll we'll reorganize things a bit and tighten it up a bit. Um, we will later actually be changing this entirely uh, w because we're going to start not using scripts once we get into the virtual machine. We'll actually be using uh, a proper configuration management tool. That's a little bit down the road. The other thing, uh, there are there are two big things that we're currently missing. Okay, which which in a, a professional environment we really ought to have. Okay, the first thing is documentation. So we don't have any documentation. Well, my excuse for that uh, at the moment is we're we're currently setting up the CI/CD pipeline that will produce our documentation. So there's that. Uh, the second thing that we don't have is tests. 
Um, so one of the things we really should have is a set of tests. Now, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of test-driven development. Uh, it's something that comes from the software world. I personally uh, think that it's also applicable to everything we do within things like oh, excuse me, the infrastructure as code world uh, and everything we do with the infrastructure. Um, because, and this is something that I try to get through to people, uh, is everything we do in IT okay, should be subject to the same engineering principles that we apply to our software. Um, and I think it's a major problem with most projects that everything to do with the environment into which we're delivering seems to be treated as a second class citizen in, t in many projects. Okay, it's not uncommon to turn up to a project and find that the very last thing they've thought about doing is building out their production environment. Uh, and that tends to then get very rushed. And consequently, things like documentation tend to be either absent or just garbage. Um, so using a test-driven approach, particularly if we go back to the idea that, uh, and, and again, this is, this is something that we will cover, um, the idea that tests in this context are basically automated requirement checks. So what we're really saying at, th at the very highest acceptance test kind of level is I have taken my requirements and translated those requirements into a set of automated checks that I can run on any environment and have that verify that my deployment has actually worked correctly. And I can run those tests at any time to ensure that nobody has done anything which has caused a requirements violation. Okay, so once you've got a good set of tests, and this is kind of the, the whole point about the low level TDD stuff in software development, once you've got a good set of tests, you can do things like refactoring of your setup uh, to change it to make it more efficient without breaking it um, because you can always rerun the tests to confirm, yes, my requirements have still been satisfied. So the important features have not changed, even though I may change completely the configuration management system I'm using. Um, yeah, replace Puppet with Salt or Ansible with Puppet or whatever. Um, and oh, excuse me, uh, but you just rerun the tests and, you know, magic happens. Okay, we'll, but we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to, first of all, uh, do a bit of tidying up. Uh, then we're going to look at um, some superficial documentation that we can add in uh, to what we've done so far. Uh, and then we can start looking at um, actually setting up uh, our, the pipeline uh, that we promised. And in doing that, we can look at how we document what we've got and how we then use our CI CD pipeline to produce, let's call it the beautiful version of the documents. Okay, the, do the version that people will actually want to read. And we'll talk about appropriateness, where documents live. Okay, so that's it. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's take a look at these, uh, these scripts that we've got. Uh, Oops. Okay, so this one is very trivial, um, and all it does is uh, provide the two prerequisites of Git and Vim. Um, uh, you'll notice that in this one, what we haven't done, uh, if I do one of the other ones, uh, let's do Docker. Okay, so in this one, you'll notice that we had uh, not only this first line, which says that this is a bash script, we also had this line, which tells the Vi editor that it's a bash script. 
that's just nice to have. This, however, I consider to be almost mandatory uh, in any operational bash script. Uh, and what this does is it says it it's my fail fast, fail hard instructions. Okay, so any undefined variable in my script that I try to use will cause the script to fail immediately. Um, any any failures in in pipes, that is all of these um, vertical bars, any anywhere in there will cause it to fail. Um, basically, almost any error that is of interest, okay, will cause these scripts to just fail completely, and that's exactly what I want to happen. Yeah, because uh, what I don't want to happen with these scripts or any script for that matter is for it to run and for errors to be being generated and me be unaware of it. Okay, because that will leave my system in an in a inconsistent state. Okay. Um, whoops. Right. So uh, let, let's let's first of all let's fix um, what the the, the problem. Of, um, as I pointed, pointed out, and that is the version of this Docker Compose. So let me just um, edit that. And now, what we could do, of course, is, and this is probably a good idea, you'll notice that this, this string is in double quotes. Okay, and we've got this here, which is the version ID, okay, which is uh, set to 1.26.2. Uh, and let me see, you said you downloaded it in 2102. Okay. So what we can do is, um, and I'm, I'm going to assume that the URL is basically the same. So let's try it. So we insert, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, oops, um, we're going to insert, uh, let's, talk, let's put it as Docker. Uh, oops. Underscore compose underscore version. Okay. And then uh, we can get rid of that. And then at the top here, okay, we can put that as a, a, a variable. Uh, now, um, this is going to be a local and it's going to be a read only variable. Uh, oops. Oh dear, it's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Okay, uh, and it's going to be Docker. Uh, and. Just for the sake of idiness, uh, why is it? And oh, come on, fingers. Okay, and then we're going to also declare it as read only. Okay. And then what is it going to be now? No, oh, because I'm an idiot. Of course, it's only valid inside functions. Okay, so um, that means now that we've only got one place to change it, which is always a good thing. Uh, in actual fact, this, uh, this uh, Docker install, uh directory we should probably make that up there as well so that we've got everything in one place yeah. uh, i don't know mm, it's not really needed anywhere else uh, and it's not something we're going to change i don't think okay so that's one thing to change the other thing to change is down here okay we've got these two lines down here now uh, in Bash, there are basically two ways Bash scripts can be end up being used. Okay, they can be run, which is what we're doing at the moment, 
or they can be sourced into another script. Okay, and if they're sourced into another script, if essentially what happens is at the point you source them into another script, it just starts reading through the sourced file, okay, and executing it. So the downside to that is if I wanted to source this into another script in order to get hold of, for example, the install Docker and the install Docker compose functions, and indeed this variable, um, the problem is that it would also then immediately call them. So it would call install Docker and it would call install Docker compose. Uh, the difficulty there, of course, is that um, I may not want to call them immediately. I may want to get the functions and then call them elsewhere. That that would be the whole point about you know, calling this thing in. So, uh, oh, thank you. Now the question is: Do we include that in? The, should we include that in the variable, or should we include it in the URL? I think we'll include it in the variable because, as you saw, I don't think the original uh, required a V. But that's something they've added. So uh, let's uh, let's do that. Okay. Um, Right, so uh, yes, as I was saying, right, down here. Okay, so what we want to do is we want some way of verifying whether this file has been sourced or whether it's being run directly. If it's being run directly, then we don't want to invoke install Docker and install Docker Compose. If, it is being, if it's being run directly, we do want to run them. Okay, so the question is, how do we know? Well, I can tell you now, it's complicated. <laughs> and it's complicated by the fact that um, not all shell scripts, and I'm talking generally about shell scripts, are born equal. Okay, There is a standard called the POSIX standard, uh, which people will jump through hoops to try to comply with. Um, and I think, by and large, it's a pointless exercise. I'll rephrase that. No. Uh, no, it by and large is a pointless exercise because most of the scripts you're going to deal with as a DevOps, you know the environment in which they're going to be run. Okay, so you don't have to account for the fact that, oh, it might be running inside you know, a K shell or a fish shell or some other shell than bash. Okay, um, you know, you know that this is going to be targeted at your infrastructure and it is going to have the bus shell available, uh, sort of by definition. If you know that parts of your infrastructure are going to be mixed, then obviously your shell script will have to account for the different shells that it's likely to encounter. Um, if you're writing a shell script for uh, general release, let's say it's part of an open source project, and you want people to be able to use it on whatever they... And yes, you need to worry about things like it being POSIX compliant and hope uh, POSIX compliant and hope that you can come up with solutions. But it it can often be a real drag to try and work out a standard way of doing it that will work everywhere. So we're not going to. What we're going to do is we're going to say um, if, and this is sort of the magic, uh, if. Uh, Oops, quotes, dollar zero. Oh, Mark. Uh, uh, is equal to. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Uh, dollar. Uh, bash underscore source and it's this this is this is the thing that would cause the problem uh oops Ash source uh if i remember correctly uh, oh blimey sorry my my um hearing aids are going off i'll have to take them out in a minute uh, sorry uh yeah if bash source blah 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 let me cover that. Oops. 
Oh. It's going to be one of those nights. Hmm. Right. Finally. And then... Okay. Now it's it's this. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's it's this that will cause the problem. Uh, this bash source, okay? Because bash source uh, is only available in bash three point zero and on. Well, uh, you just need to be aware of the. Yeah, that problem. Mm -hmm. All right, in course, we'll do the same thing. I'm insane. Yeah. Okay, so we do the same thing there. Uh, this exit zero at the end here, it's kind of optional. This just makes sure that if we've made any goofs uh, um, and left, for example, if install, it was necessary in this script when install concourse fly is run, because um, the last thing in installing that concourse fly does actually return an error code. It would probably be better uh, to do something like this. Uh, get rid of that thing and actually force this. Uh, to return uh, zero. Um, because then, because then we put the the correction of the error where it belongs. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, while we're here, we might as well. Uh, and then we might as well um, seriously. All right, might as well fix that up while we're here. Uh, now we've got the same problem here that this sudo apt will always be run when bootstrap is wrapped or included. But as I said last last week, um, idempotency demands that when we run a script, uh, it will always produce the same result for the same inputs. In this case, we're kind of relying on sudo apt um, to uh, do that for us. So if Git and Vim are already installed, it will just install the updates. Which, as I said last week, is a bit shonky because we may not want it to. Um, however, uh, we can get rid of one error just by changing that, I suppose. Uh, to that. Mm. Right. Uh, okay, so let's... Okay, so we fixed up docker.sh, we fixed up concourse, we fixed up bootstrap. Time to do a test. Let's just make sure that we've not broken anything. So we can go back to um, vagrant up 
And if you remember from last week, we can do provision to force it to rerun the provisioning scripts. All I'm really looking for here is that we haven't completely screwed the pooch. Um, in order to test them fully, of course, we would need to uh, um, build the thing from scratch. And you see here it's recreating the concourse uh, CI concourse. And this is because, if you remember, mine was modified. And because it was modified, uh, when I've done the run the script, it's brought down the original version, which means it's changed. So now we can go in and have a look what the problem was. Okay, and the problem was this here which is the rule for the external URL prefix is generated by concourse, which is the tool we're going to use for our CICD. And I need that to read 9981. Now, rather than go in and re-edit it, we might as well just fix it. So what we need to do to fix it is we need to get uh, vagrant to pass in the environment variable uh, when uh, an a variable in our vagrant script. So specifically, we need it to pass this concourse port variable in to this concourse script uh, at the time we call it. Uh, and we need to get it to uh, modify the concourse script to then change uh, the way it does the substitutions. So if I, um, okay, so in this script, if you remember, we had these two set statements, okay, that modify the Docker Compose. OK, so this first one says, OK, we'll take the 8080 and map it to 9080. OK, um, and then that is what causes the problem with our URI. Now, we've got a number of choices here, because um, if you look at the uh, Docker Compose file, the port is mentioned twice. It's mentioned once to map this port here. Uh, okay, so this port here is mapped by the Docker Compose, and it then assumes that that's going to be the external port number that our URL needs to have. Okay, so there are two ways we can go. We can either say, okay, everything gets put on the concourse port, uh, or we can make life more difficult for ourselves, and we can say, no. Uh, only the URL and the host port should be changed. I'm never one for making my life difficult. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to concourse port. Okay. And then we're going to pass in... Uh, and substitute this is going to become a variable, okay, which will be the port number that we want to assign. Okay. Now, in order to do that, I need to just change this to double quotes because otherwise uh, we won't be able to do the substitution. And what is this? Actually, let's make it obvious what we're going to be doing because uh... okay. 
So we're going to actually write in the concourse port here that, that is going to change the Docker Compose. So everything will be put on the same concourse port. And then this one down here actually does the mapping between the guest, our VM, and our host, which is our PC on which we're running. Everybody following this? So all we need to do now is get this into the script. Now, what we could do is we could actually change, uh, oops, we could change this line here and pass it in just as a command line, or we can pass it in as an environment variable. Okay, so if we go to here, yeah, when we go to vagrant, uh, and okay, so what what we what what we're basically asking is, can I pass uh, an environment variable? Let's say, okay, so uh, let's see whether they've. Uh, now how do I pass environment variable? There we go. Uh, nothing, because there's no such thing as an environment. Environment. Here we go. Nope, this is just their environment. Yeah, then there must be a way of doing it. Arguments to pass to the shell script. Env. Dun, dun, dun. List of key value pairs to pass as environment variables. There you go. That's exactly what we want. So what we need to do is on here is just say env. Uh, now then, it's a list of key value pairs. Uh, okay, so it's uh, uh, this is where my Ruby foo lets me down because uh, I don't know Ruby particularly well. Uh, Ruby list. Array list implementation in Ruby. Uh, Ruby array offers a full list interface. Fine, because I wrote it. It's just an array then, is it? Blah, blah. Oh, I'm not going to really go to all that trouble. Can I create them directly? Yes, I can. Uh, come on. What I have to do? That's more like. Okay, so all I need to do is environment and then it will be and course and the value will be whatever the concourse port is. Really? Oh, let's give that a go. We'll soon know if it's right. Nope. Oh, it must be a hash. That's not what he said. Okay. So what we actually need 
use the Ruby hash, which makes more sense when you think about it. I assume, yeah, curly braces with arrows, much more sensible. Mm. That makes a lot more sense. Okay, one close, whoops. And this. Mm -hmm. I assume how she's a key voice brings. That looks more promising, doesn't it? And it's recreating the concourse, which is a good sign. Now, if everything's gone according to plan, this should start working again once it's all up and running. I'm still waiting for it to finish. That's a bit weird. What have I done wrong? Mm -hmm. It looks to me like that concourse script has locked up. Right, what have I done wrong? Right, let's try. It's probably locked up here, waiting for this. Uh, so, the URL is the first argument. So, what, what URL have I passed it? Wait on, so there you see, this is what happens when you're a dumbass. Having changed that, I need to change this, um, and that needs to be um, a concourse port. And we need to change that to be the concourse port as well. Mm. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Now, this also brings up another issue. What happens if that concourse port isn't defined for some reason? Uh, uh, for example, somebody calls this script without specifying a concourse port. Well, we can deal with that because what we can do is up here, we can set concourse port to a default. Um, I guess. <laughs> Let's be good about this. And then, uh, do we want it just, I think we, we want it, this one? Uh, and then we want uh, nine zero.
At least it finished. Have we now got a functioning site? No, and the reason is because you notice it hasn't done this rebuild, and that's because our concourse didn't actually change. Uh, you remember? Do you remember uh, last week when the concourse script didn't change? It this didn't get run at all. Now, what's happened is because Docker Compose hasn't changed, uh, it's saying it's up to date. Um, so let uh, we said that. Why hasn't it changed? Let's have a look. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I think it skipped over because uh, it, 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 this is obvious nonsense. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run that script directly. Uh, Oops, actually, I'm not as it was. Ah, no, oh, this is not my day. All right, what we got now. The typical concourse CIO is not trusted. Okay. Oh. Oh. Uh -oh. Um. I'm very curious. Right, I'm going to cheat. Interesting. That's because I just got rid of the damn thing. Ah. Oh. Okay. If in doubt. Hmm? <laughs> okay. If I were if I were a, a less honest person, I would say, yeah, I did that deliberately so I could show you how to rebuild the machine. But truth is, I screwed up. 
And this is just the quickest way of fixing the problem, I think. Oh, there. <laughs> that assumes I've actually fixed it. Hmm. Just bear with me a second. I'm going to go and take my hearing aids out. Because mm, they're beeping in my ear telling me the batteries are flat. I'll be back in um, two minutes. Oh, right, sorry about that. Oop, the dog decided he wanted to go outside. <laughs> hmm. All right, settle down again. Uh, right, well, while that's going, um, let's consider uh, what we've actually just done. Um, we've, we've tidied up a little bit. Uh, what we're going to do next is I'm just going to move the, the two installer scripts uh, and, and the instructions in the bootstrap script. I'm going to move those into a subdirectory just to keep them neat and tidy. Uh, and then uh, we're going to change things so that those uh, kinds of sourcing uh, to another script. And then run. I'll let it probably easier if I show you. Um, but the idea is really just to tidy everything up so that it, the the vagrant file will become somewhat simpler, and uh, it also means that when we transition to um, using a full configuration management system, it will probably make a little bit more sense uh, because we'll only be replacing one script really. Uh, well, what, I'll re rephrase that. We're replacing one script in the Vagrant file, uh, but we're, we'll be replacing all of the uh, install scripts with a new configuration management system. And, ooh, right, okay, so what happened? Why is it doing this now? Concourse CI org is not trusted. Why has it suddenly started doing that, do you think? Mm. Uncle CR. Oh, it seems okay there.
Mm, this is a good one. Uh, I mean, my browser and uh, the, the browser and this should be using the same uh, resolver for the name. Uh, I mean, the only uh, it should, I mean, we shouldn't have any cached information because we've just rebuilt the virtual machine and that's returning okay. Interesting. Uh, I mean, it's possible that the CA certs on this box are out of date. Yeah. Check certificates under website settings. Um, yeah, but I mean, the, the problem is on the virtual machine, though. I mean, this is uh, it's working fine in the browser. Uh, what I will say is I think we're using an older version of the uh, what's the vagrant file using uh, it's using this bento box which may be out of date in which case the CA cert could be wrong maybe uh, I thought that the box mm, latest installed version. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, let's get a new virtual machine. This is this is a problem you may not have because. Um, I've been lazy and haven't updated my box lately. Mm. I mean, if this is the problem, it's a bit of a signal because it was working okay. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, update CA Trust it may very well have done it. Uh, the, the CA Trust maybe out of date on the machine. Um, and I could have done it locally, but let's do it the long way around um, and just make sure that everything's working properly. Uh, so we should get um, the latest version now. Version 2020. Yep. Okay. So that, this should already have all of the latest certs on it. Um, we'll see, shall we? Uh, but yeah, no, you're quite right. I mean, I could have I could have logged onto the virtual machine and tried to do a CA cert update, um, or just updated the whole system with a you know uh, a generic app update. Which would have really done what this has just done. Um, right. Um, okay. Well, while that's cooking, uh, I have to remember to connect everything, otherwise you're not going to see this. So. <laughs> well, connect. There we go. Okay. Right. Just while that machine's rebuilding, um, this is the situation, uh, and this is the diagram I drew last week. Um, now, what we've got now uh, is 
this port, this port here, okay, is 981. Mm, let's just. All right. Okay, this is this is the host port from our vagrant file. Uh, this guest port is also now uh, nine zero eight one. Okay, and the web app, it, the, the the web server within the concourse container is also now. Mm. on 9081 okay which makes our setup somewhat simpler than it was uh, and also means that now we only have to set the vagrant file variable concourse port and it should propagate throughout the system so in your case it'll be 9080 uh, because I've already got a concourse on my host running on 9080 I've switched mine to 9081. If you've already got something run on that port, you just pick another one. It doesn't matter. Um, as, as long as it's not one of the privileged ports, fill your boots up. Okay, so that's where we're at now. Uh, okay, what we're going to do next. Uh, okay, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just do a quick bit of restructuring. Like I said, at the moment, what we've got is we've got the Vagrant file. Uh, we've got Docker, Shell, Concourse, Shell, Bootstrap, Shell, all in the same directory. Uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to move these three scripts uh, into a subdirectory. Uh, I'll call it lib just for the sake of this exercise. And then uh, this script bootstrap, I'm going to rename to be something like uh, standard packages. Okay. And then at this top level, we'll have bootstrap. SH and what Bootstrap SH will do is it will source each of these and then do all of the installs in one place. Okay, that way uh, we know just by looking at the Bootstrap script, we know exactly what's been going on. And frankly, once these are working, we don't really care what they do day to day. All I really now yeah, it's still doing it. Uh, so that idea was bogus. Uh, let me just try the alternative method. Uh, let's try SSH and try this uh, uh, sudo update CA. Oops. Trust. I mean, it's a bit unlucky if this is the problem. Uh, Uh, no, it helps if you actually enter the right command. Uh, uh, no, that was the right command. Uh, ah. I mean, the problem is that Ah, it's going to be one of those days. Hmm. Really? Oh, of course, I don't. It's all right. I don't have my command line set up my way. Um, let's try. I'm pretty sure this has already been done as part of the build, so. Yeah, so we're all up to date. Um, yeah, the the problem is that this that 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 
app get update should have updated all the CA certs as well. And like I said, it it must be something that I've done be, because um, because uh, ah oh. Uh, it must be something I've done because it was working fine and dandy until I started messing about with it. Uh, let's just try let's just try running this from the command line. Oh get out of here. Uh, Really? That's the game we're going to play, is it? Uh, okay. Uh, well, there's a mystery. <laughs> yeah well yeah well that, that that's just it i think that that's already present Pavza. i think that would be uh I think they're already there. And as you've just seen, it works fine from the command line, so... I don't think that's the problem. Yeah. Mm, no, it's, it's something to do with the way that script has been modified. Uh, like I said, it would have been extraordinarily, whoops, uh, it would have been extraordinarily unlucky. Oh. Uh. Oh, of course. Uh. Uh, why am I trying to go into opt? I don't need to go into opt. Oh. Right. Uh, yeah, it would be extremely unlucky if those sorts had come out of date like during this session. So I, I don't. I think that's a red herring. Uh, I think the problem is that I'm being a dumbass, and there's something I've done. I wonder if it's something to do with the way that environment variable is getting set. I mean, why would that, why would that cause a problem unless... I'll tell you what, let's just try that. Let's just try... Uh, 
Hmm. Oh. Okay. Mm, let's just copy. Mm. Oops. Uh, and then remove that line and try. I mean, I can't imagine why that would upset it, uh, um, unless there's some weird environment variable that's needed and that end overwrites it. There you go, working fine. Son of a bitch. So maybe... That seems a bit excessive, doesn't it? Hmm? It's just because of the slow progress. Anyway, right, okay, so that was the difference. Uh, there's no point letting it run through. Uh, so why would that end environment cause a failure of that script? Uh, I mean, that, that failure I could understand. But it's not. It's this that's failing. So somehow, yes, yes, I removed the end. I removed the end just, just to see, because that's the only thing I could think that would be interfering with it. And it obviously was. But the question is why? Uh, Why why would why would having that environment variable cause this get to fail? I'm I'm a I've got to admit I'm a bit of a loss. Now I'm sure I've done this before. Let me just look at one of my older Oh hang on a minute, I'll bet I'm logged into the wrong Oh no, I'm in the right one. Maybe 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 um Let's just have a look at one of my other projects. Uh, now, did I change this one? Yeah, this 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 version. Uh, I need to go back to before I changed. Yeah, see here I switched to salt uh, in May. This is what it used to look like. So uh, I didn't bother with that, but um, did I invoke it? Yeah, this is the environment variable that was passed. Uh, now, I did pass it as a string and a symbol rather than a string. Uh, maybe. 
maybe it maybe it is this maybe 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 my ruby has once again screwed the pooch let's just whoops uh, oh wait a minute uh, don't tell me come on ah oh. all right mm -hmm. That's not the problem. This is the problem. And it's because when you do this, this is just a symbol. That's not how you spell concourse. And this is a string. Mm. Like that. Okay, so that seems to be the correct format. Oops, in Ruby. Now, now we've got a, now this is becoming a major mystery. Okay, maybe there's something special about calling it concourse port. Let's call it, um, let's call it the, blah, what do you call it? External port? Uh, I mean, why? Uh, um, why would that? Why would that cause a problem? Now the question is, do I then have to change it throughout this script? I mean, why on God's green earth? It's an issue. I don't know. Well, I've got to admit, I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm lost now. Uh, so let's continue. See what we get. Uh, So that was the changes to Vagrant file. Uh, oh, this is all the salt stuff, so. Not really relevant. Yeah, it's going to be a problem. So we don't want to, we don't want to see all of that. Uh, 
All right, so if we go back to here, ah, this is the change. Okay, so when I made this change, I passed the port in there. I then did that, which is basically what we're doing. Mm. Substituted that. Oh. It looks like I made the same change, basically. The only difference seems to be I didn't put quotes around that, but why that would interfere with this. Something about passing the variables from Vagrant to the VM. So, yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, that's what seems to be happening, but uh, uh, this has obviously been working for me. Um, um, And it, you know, this is the same script. Mm, so why? I suppose what we could do is we we could let's just try a debugging step, shall we? Uh, let's try this uh, in here. Uh, let's just. Oops. Hang on, I'm lost now. Have I? You changed my. All right, in here, we can just do that. Uh, might have to write it out to error, I suppose. Right, so. Now, oh, now it's just taking the piss. Really? Really? Writing out the environment variables causes it to start working. Unless uh, making that, oops, uh, unless we run into the same problem as we had last time. If you remember last time, we had the problem that if this if the script didn't change, it didn't get rewritten, but then it did change. And we this this machine was rebuilt from scratch at one point, so and now it's working. Well, the only thing I can think of is that this. Do you remember we got kicked in the teeth last time because if the concourse.sh script doesn't change between the host and what it thinks it's got hi ginger guy cool um yeah because because it didn't change between between the two invocations it may not have got copied up i don't know it doesn't make any sense to me Nice.
I have to say we've got we've got a uh, final project coming up. Cool. We've got a very mixed bunch, I think, of, of people with different abilities um, and in different areas. Uh, if anybody here is a networking expert, when, when, when we start talking about networking in detail, uh, you feel free to chime in because I know, I know enough about networking to get myself into a lot of trouble. <laughs> And if there's one thing you should take away from this session is shit happens. And sometimes it, it can be very frustrating because there's no, you know, you, you kind of investigate it. And then like now, you add something random in and it suddenly starts working. And then you think to yourself, well, hang on a minute. You know, this system's deterministic. It's not like it just decided not to work suddenly. There must be a reason for it. The problem is that because you've moved on, uh, you now think to yourself, well, hang on a minute, what, the, what, what could possibly have changed? Oh, nice. Google network training. Uh, have Cloud Academy access to exam track was easy. Nice. Uh, uh, and right now, the big question is, is this now working? Finally. Okay. Oh, yes, I know. I disturbed you. I'm sorry, but I have things to do. Settle down. Come on. If you want to stay up, you have to lay still. Right. Now that we've got this out of the way, and we're, we're back now with the correct stuff, um, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, we've now got, uh, right, we don't need that vagrant file underscore anymore, so let's get rid of that. <laughs> Make sure I get rid of the right one. Uh, that tags file, by the way, is um, written by Vi. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so um, we've got our files, so let's, in fact, let's just... Uh, Mm. Let's just add whoops the tags into here. Oh, why are you go away? If you don't stop fidgeting, you have to you have to get down. Do you want to get down? Don't look at me like that. Go on. Go on. You stay down there for a bit. Right. Um, okay, so that means it will now ignore that git, uh, that tags file. So let's, uh, let's add everything in. And yes, I know I could do it the, the short way. Uh, but as I explained, it's it's not a good habit to get into. Um, uh, doing git add dot. Okay, so there's our new file. So if I commit those, uh, and what should we call this? Um, refactor. Oops. Okay, so what will we do? Uh, old scripts. Uh, let's call it sortable. I'm not sure if that's a word. Mm, and if it was, I'm not sure how to spell it that way. Uh, so we've made the script sourceable. What else did we do? Um, oh, yes. Um, <laughs> the one that caused all the problems. Okay, that'll be... That's, that's enough for now, isn't it? 
And right, so if I push that, seriously. Okay. This is file example to make Python and Flask web app and use Jenkins to. to you know what? The, this is something I, I think I, I think I mentioned it in my very first one of these um, sessions. Jenkins is maligned on R slash DevOps, um, and I, I keep saying to people, look, there are loads of places still using it, and it's not. I mean, it is not the best solution necessarily. But it's so widely used that you're almost inevitably going to come across it at some point in your career, if only for legacy systems. So it's very worth learning. Oh, oh Linux. Mm. Love it. Uh, right. OK, so that's that updated. Um, let's just quickly do what I said I was going to do. Um, so we're going to uh, make a directory. Uh, let's call it lib. It's not a particularly imaginative name. And then we'll move all of these scripts into there. Um, uh, Uh, now, bootstrap's going to be a bit of an odd one. Because uh, I want to move it and rename it. So I'm going to call it lib slash standard oops, packages. Okay, what? Oh, idiot. Uh, get move. Okay. Now, the reason it's a bit of an odd one is because we're, we're now going to actually, uh, actually, rather than call it just bootstrap, let's call it uh, something a bit more descriptive okay and because I'm lazy uh, let's take the first uh, okay Customer support. Ugh, customer support. I used to. I I actually had one job when I was contracting. Uh, very early in my contracting career, and uh, I was actually working, uh, and I was sitting amongst the uh, support team. Uh, they were actually supporting within a bank environment, so they were basically the IT support for the bank. Um, and every now and again, they would say, oh, they got a code 18. And I, eventually I said to the guy, code 18, what's a code 18? I've never heard of a code 18. He said, oh, he said the error is 18 inches from the screen. Uh, right, now then. Uh, insert. So now we can insert all of our libraries now uh, it doesn't matter what order we actually insert them in uh, because they shouldn't run Uh, 
Um, what would I call it? Standard package shell. Uh, th did, did I call it standard package or package? It should be packages. Uh, um, otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. Okay. And then um, we just need to pull all of the various functions. Uh, so now in this case, um, uh, we technically we don't really, well, I, you know, we could do the same. Actually, yeah, let's do the same trick. Let's be consistent, shall we? Uh, okay, so. We'll use the same trick that we did with these. Uh, okay, so we're going to use the same trick. Uh, and in fact, in this case, we could take those lines as well. Um, Okay, and then do now. Uh, you want those in first because otherwise these won't work, and we want the standard packages. This is where I find out. Did I? I did plural it. Cool. Uh, and now that we're actually including this, uh, we want to do this trick uh, and put it into uh, a function. I guess this. Let's call this uh, install. Uh, let's call it install user tools. Ah. Really, it's going to be one of those. Things. Uh. And uh, it does have the auto formatting on. There you go. Uh, uh, and then. Um, Right. And the only other thing we're going to do is change our vagrant pole. So now, uh, instead of uh, we're, we're going to copy them, uh, we're going to copy bootstrap server and all of the contents of lib. Uh, so we need that. We don't need that. We don't need uh, well. Uh, we don't need those two. This will become
Now then, uh, I'm pretty sure that you just use file and just specify two directories. Um, yeah, okay. And of course, we could actually further do this if we um, we could make this even tighter, I suppose, by moving everything into an installer directory and then just copying the whole thing up in one go. Mm. Uh, well, maybe that's something we can do in a second. Uh. Okay. Let's try. See how badly I've screwed it up. Oh. Okay, so we need to do this basically the same way. As I did this one. Mm. Yeah, thought, I thought so, yeah. We can just put the... Uh, odd. Um, now, the only one we actually need to make executable is this bootstrap server script. Uh, okay. Oh, come on. No such file or directory. Concourse.sh. Evidently, that did not do what I expected. Why not? Source destination. Why oh, wouldn't that work? Mm. Oh, come on, you're just being annoying now. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lips in there. Oh, I know, I know what it's doing. It's uh <laughs> you and me both, I think. Uh, oh, actually, it's not too bad here. Mm -hmm. 
Right, now then, um, let's just see what's going on in here. Why? The only thing I can think of is that when it runs the Bootstrap server, It's running it from a different um, working directory. I don't remember that being a problem before. But then again, so if I go in here, you see, this is what I'd normally do is use this. Okay, set the directory of the script mm. this is actually a good this is actually a good lesson um and one that obviously i don't always follow myself and that is always be expressive always be explicit about your intentions okay um Here, I'm being implicit about my intentions because I'm assuming that this, this script will always be executed with the current working directory being the one where the script is. This is not a good assumption. Uh, and hence you get problems like where, like I'm having. Okay, whereas... Oops. Ah, uh, horrible thing. Mm. Oh, come on, give me a break. Okay. Yay! We have a winner. Okay, yeah, I, as I was saying, um, I, I kind of broke my own rules there. Uh, generally speaking, um, and, and this is one of the sort of general principles that can be applied almost everywhere, it is better to be explicit than to be implicit. Uh, in other words, if you have a choice between, as I did, uh, assuming something, like, for example, this script will always be executed with the current working directory being the one in which the script lives, and being explicit which is what that modification did, okay? Um, uh, mm, ah, come on, Mark, what are you doing? Uh, bootstrap, there we go. Yeah, so here what I've done is I've explicitly calculated or worked out what the directory is for this script, the bootstrap server script, not the current working directory, the one in which I'm actually sitting, okay? If I can figure that out, then here I can put in explicit instructions that say, make sure that you load the correct um, script from that directory relative to the, 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 the script that is currently running, okay? So this line um, is a reasonably consistent way of finding out the script in which the current one is running, uh, uh, yeah, of finding the directory in which the script exists, not the one in which it's currently running from. Okay, because it's possible to do things like um, 
you know, uh, you don't have to be in. You don't have to be in, for example, this directory to run the Bootstrap script. I could be anywhere. Similarly, I can't. I, I don't have to be in slash temp on the guest machine uh, in order to run that Bootstrap script. I could be anywhere. And in actual fact, I, I suspect Vagrant probably has it. The current working directory set to root. Um, yeah, you know, slash root. Um, yeah, the root home uh, The root users home directory uh, but the point is you shouldn't ever assume that that's going to be the case because that could change out of your control okay so what we've done here is we've decoupled this script from vagrant so if i were to run this under different circumstances i might for example be running you know on a uh, aws instance OK, I could still copy these files across and run them and I should get the same result. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Um, right, so we've now got some changes to put in and they seem to be working. So absent any tests, I'm going to just assume that everything's OK. Well, actually, I suppose the one test I could do is make sure that uh, this dashboard's still available. Seems to be. OK, so. Now, that is a test that we could actually do uh, when we start writing tests. Um, uh, but let's. Uh... OK, so you can see here we've got these three files that have been renamed. Uh, we've modified this one and we've modified standard packages and we've modified the bootstrap server. Okay, so we're we're all good to go now. So uh, this is just restructure 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 uh, 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 restructure reorganize. Uh, there's not really much much else to write in there because it should be evident when somebody reads it what we've done. We're just really just telling people reading the log file. Eh, we just did a restructure. There's no functional changes as such. Uh, so let's uh, just take that as is. And we'll push that up so everything should be available to you guys to compare and contrast. Right. OK, well, it took a while, but we got there in the end. Now, we're still absent documentation. We're still absent testing, but we are now in a position where our machine is all set up with. Um, and we don't need that. That's just the one I got. Uh, that's just the one I got when I was trying to figure out why the thing had gone mental. And I still haven't figured out why. Uh, but I'm going to pretend that it never happened. That way my conscience can be clear. OK. Let's move on to the next step then. So we've now got our machine set up and we've got concourse installed on it. Mm, let's go back to... Funky diagrams again. Mm. Oh, press button to continue. It's shut down. All right. Uh, right. Uh, well, well, I will. I will accept it on the desktop when it appears. No. Nope. Oh, there it is. All right. Look a wall. Uh, okay. 
Uh, actually, we don't need any of this anymore. Okay, let's let's uh, just. Uh, I'm going to now ignore uh, all of the stuff that we, we've done basically, and just describe what we've now got installed on our machine. So what we've done is we've installed basically two things: Docker and Concourse. Now Docker. Uh, as I hope most of you know, is um, it just makes setting up and using containers uh, more convenient. Okay, it is a de facto standard. Um, personally, I could care less. Um, oh, actually, this is interesting. Well, it's interesting if you're a geek. Um, Docker, okay. Containers are basically um, a standardized, nowadays, are a standardized approach to structuring various features of the Linux kernel and combining them with layered file systems. Come on. Come on. If you're coming up, come up. Don't look at me like that. Come on. No. What? Do you want to go out? You don't want to go out. Come on. Can you... Come on then. There you go. Right. Ooh, settle down. Now then. Um, yeah, there is standardized um, there, there is standardized way of, of, of packaging up um, various features of the Linux kernel. Principle of those being C groups. Okay, and C groups allow you to isolate processes, which is sort of the key thing. Okay, it's the it's it's what everybody bangs on about when they talk about containers is is process isolation. Containers have got uh, a, a layered file system which has various advantages, um, but, uh, but principally uh, the, the feature that everybody goes on about is process isolation, uh, and that's uses C groups which are very very old, um, a very very old feature of the kernel. Um, and people kind of thought, hang on a minute, we can package this all up and make it all nice and neat. And then you've got containers. Uh, and Docker came along and they said, oh, we can actually improve the construction of these containers and we can make it much more convenient. And Docker was born. Um, so why am I banging on about this? Oh, yeah, um, because C groups are actually used in various other places, among which is System D. System D is the um, it's it it's principally the replacement for the service management systems um, on Linux and Linux-like systems. Or, uh, let's call them Nix systems. Um, and System D actually uses C groups precisely for the same thing. It, it's it's. Uh, in essence, is a, um, a C group orchestration system. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to do all sorts of sexy things with services and standardize the way that they're configured. And there is heated debate um, about whether or not system D should be allowed to live. Um, however, I think that debate is largely over because most um, distributions now have accepted that system D is the way everybody's going forward. Um, but there are still holdouts. There are still systems that use old service management and, and uh, what they call um, uh, uh, PID1 um, startup uh, systems. Anyway, uh, sorry, that was a, a bit of a bit of a side bar. Okay, so what we've got, oops, didn't really mean to do that. Um, what we've got is, uh, okay, what we've got is this thing's no longer sharing its screen. Ah, there we go. All right, we're back. Ah, I thought that way. Okay, so, um, yes. OK, so I'm now going to be talking almost exclusively about the virtual machine we've just created. 
Okay, so on here we've got Docker, uh, and Docker uh, in in Docker we've created two uh, containers. Okay, one of them is just the Postgres database, which is used by the other one, which is our concourse container. Okay, so concourse basically just uses this Postgres database. Now, this is where it starts to get a bit mind bending because concourse is basically a container orchestration system all in it, all on its own. And in fact, this is true of most other uh, build systems, modern build systems that work on a similar basis. Things like GitHub Actions, GitLab, uh, whatever theirs is called. Um, uh, I think Travis is similar. Um, but basically what they do is they are container orchestrators. Uh, so what you do is you provide containers with all of the tooling you need for your build. And then in one end, you feed in your sources, usually from a Git repository or something similar. And then it gets passed from container to container. OK, so in concourse, we can set up a pipeline which basically says something along these lines. I've got a Git repository which feeds into, let's say, let's be really simple, build. OK, and this is just a container. OK, and Git is basically fetched into this container. The build is then run, so there'll be a script in here which gets run. OK, and that script will then produce various outputs and those outputs are written into a volume which is just another it's it's another form of container but it's re really what a volume is in essence it's the layered file system from a container but without all of the extra gubbins so just think of it as a file uh, or a file system okay now that that volume can then be passed to another container. Let's call it our deployment container. Yeah, just keeping things simple. So this deployment container can now take that volume, which has got all of the artifacts generated by our build, and it can then write those out to, let's say, our system. In other words, it can deploy them onto a target environment, whatever that is. OK, so you can see all what Concourse is doing really is saying, OK, you tell me where I should get stuff from, what I should do with it in however many steps you want to make it, and what I should do with it once I've finished. And that's it. That's th that, in essence, is what a build system does. It's not very complicated. But boy, they can get complicated. But the principle is very simple. And frankly, you know, this business, okay, you know, all, 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 all this stuff, okay, is uh, a sort of bonus. Um, little story. When I started out, um, when we did builds, uh, they were simple wee beasties, okay? Not much more sophisticated than, uh, well, they were make files, okay? And you just ran the make file in your file system and it built everything into your file system. And then you would run make install and it would install it onto whatever system, okay? Uh, and that works fine, but. It relies on things like um, you having or everyone having the same uh, compiler installed, making sure that your build system doesn't. Uh, if you run this sort of um, iteratively on a build system, you've got to make you've got to be very careful that you don't change your environment in any way between builds. 
Uh, classic case in point, and the one that prompted me, first of all, to investigate changing the way we did builds. Uh, Windows, and I don't know whether it's still the case, because I haven't worked on Windows systems for many, many years. But back in the day, uh, let me see, what would it be? Windows 2000, maybe? Windows NT, was it called Windows NT? Yeah, Windows NT. I think that was the last one I worked on aggressively. I had the unfortunate experience of working on Windows XP at various times, but really only as a host, not as a target. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry, I'm rambling again. Um, yeah, it used to have a thing called uh, the... Whoa. Okay, what it was basically was whenever you built like a DLL or something like that, it got spun up into a, a central global place, okay? And that was kind of like a registry of all the DLLs that were installed on your system. God, I can't remember the name of the thing. Um but what would happen is if you did a build, okay, and you forgot to tear down this DLL store, the old one would sit around. Uh, and it was possible for you end, to end up linking the rest of your code to this old object, okay, even if you reran the build. I'm making a model of this, but believe me, it was a pain in the arse. And the problem was that the discipline required to make sure that engineers would correctly tear down every build after every time uh it became a nightmare uh so, so much so that it was very very easy to make a mistake and end up deploying especially into test environments where you know the bar for rebuilds was lower um you know on production environments we tended to do a complete rebuild whereas in test environments we would often just do incremental builds so you do a build then do a build again then do a build again and so on and yeah, the long and the short of it is we had a whole series of issues where we would get really subtle bugs because of the mix of, of different versions of DLLs that were being built at different times. So eventually I lost my temper and uh, we'd actually just invested in VMware and we're looking at using virtual machines. Now, this is going back some, and the hypervisors uh, were not like today. You know, we don't, the, the, the chip sets in the computers didn't really support virtualization like they do now. So you needed a fairly beefy machine to run these virtual machines on because um, it was all in software. Uh, what are they called? They're called uh, layer two hypervisors or type two hypervisors. I can't remember. Anyway, um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So what we did was we actually set up a virtual machine with all of the tools that we needed. Okay, and the bare bones of what we needed for the build system. Then we took a snapshot. Then we would deploy the build onto it and run the build, and then just reset the snapshot. So it. it you know, or if we wanted to do an incremental build, then what we would do is deploy the build onto it, okay, run it, uh, but run it, uh, run it after we'd taken the snapshot. So everything was in place. Then we would take the artifacts on the file system, but not all the crap that was loaded into the. Uh, this central repository thing, you know, you know, the tracker, and we would snapshot that. Okay, so we snapshot the file system rather than the rather than the in memory stuff. The, the upshot of all this was that we could get nice repeatable builds without the overhead of all the problems of this central thing getting cocked up and developers forgetting to take stuff out. Now, fast forward twenty odd years. Build systems are basically doing the same thing, but they're using containers rather than full virtual machines, and it makes a lot of sense. Okay, uh, so containers basically achieve the same result. So what you'll see when we start working with Concourse is it has uh, workers that keep track of all of these um, containers, okay, 
well, they, they are the containers in effect. Okay. And it will pick one that is appropriate for whichever build you're doing, and it will then load all the source code in and run it. Very cool. Because you can start from either standard normal Docker um, containers, or you can build your own custom ones, and it can use those. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to start with Sphinx, which is the uh, static site builder we're going to use. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, and we're going to put that, uh, we, I think it's actually, uh, Sphinx Dock has already got a container built with the basic Sphinx in. So we'll take a look at that and see how to set that up and configure it. Um, and then uh, we'll set up a simple pipeline that will just build a website. Uh, and then we'll look at how we deploy it later. Uh, and that will give us an idea of how to set these things up. Now, uh, before we move on, uh, the, the advantage of using something like Concourse rather than, say, GitHub Actions is that GitHub Actions are tied to um, GitHub, unsurprisingly. Uh, using Concourse, I can give a developer this virtual machine setup, for example, and they can run Concourse exactly the same way as my build system will run it. Uh, as we'll see later, they can even run it using files on their local system rather than ones that are submitted to the Git repository, or they can run a mixture of the two. Okay, so Concourse, in my opinion, is more flexible in that respect. That said, I don't fundamentally have anything against GitHub or any of those other tools. So, you know, fill your boots up. They all basically work the same way. Uh, they all use YAML files to define your build, pipelines, tasks. The terminology is very similar across them. Uh, they all basically do the same thing. They all use Docker images. They all use volumes to pass data between them. Um, I guess GitHub Actions has one distinct advantage if you need to do things like multi-platform testing. They provide that. Uh, whereas we would have to set up different virtual machines. And I mean, in a real environment, the, the final build environment would actually use workers that were installed on different virtual machines or different, even bare metal machines. Um, I'm starting to wander off again. Uh, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, otherwise I'm definitely going to lose your interest. Okay, Sphinx. It's worth talking about Sphinx just briefly. Um, Sphinx is uh, started out uh, really as the Python documentation system. Uh, let's, uh, let's just go to Sphinx. Um, is it Sphinx? Read the docs. Read the dicks. Ah. Uh, uh, Actually, sphinxstop.org, yeah, that's probably as good a place as any to start. There we go. So Sphinx is, it, now, it started out as the Python documentation system. It's much more than that. Um, it's a really sophisticated static site generator. And uh, although it's still very much uh, geared towards Python, the thing that I'm attracted to is the fact that we can also use it for bash script auto documentation to a degree uh, and uh, Lua, which is another language that I use uh, a fair amount. Um, so it, it can extract comments from those and construct document sets. Uh, Python is by far still the, the main 
use case for us. Uh, but it, it, pretty much any language, you can either use what you've already got or you can construct your own uh, processes uh, for extracting comments or even extracting syntactic information from the language itself, which is what you know uh, Python, the Python processes do. Uh, and if you've ever you looked at something like read the docs, um, you will find that uh, Sphinx has got output generators that can produce documentation that looks exactly like read the docs. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the Python projects that produce documentation use exactly that. They use Sphinx and they output it using read the docs. Okay. Uh, what time is it? Okay, let me see. It's quarter past nine here. Been going for a couple of hours. Um, I suppose the question is, um, let's, okay, let's take this in two steps. First of all, is everybody up to speed on where we are and happy that they understand the setup we've got so far? Yeah, what? What? Yes, I know. Okay, I'll assume everybody is. Um, Hang on a minute. Conceptually, yes, we'll need to take a closer look at the chair. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've pushed them already into the repository. Uh, so you, you you could do a diff now um, and see the changes. Um, what? I mean, to be honest, most of what we did today was tidying up so far. Uh, and making things just a little bit more um, flexible by allowing the port changes and uh, just restructuring to make it a bit easier to, to read and to transfer between uh, different environments. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be in Vagrant. It could be on any virtual machine fairly easily. Right, um, okay. Uh, I think the next thing we'll do is we'll just take a look at Sphinx and the Sphinx Docker container, because that's the one we're going to use initially to in our build system. Now, the great thing is, uh, I think, and I could get bitten in the ass here. Um, I think um, the Docker... Okay, Sphinx doc. That looks like. Uh, now then, I, I, I assume this is the Docker CI for Sphinx itself. Yep. Uh, oh, come on. Uh, and this. Okay, there are two versions. This one will be a lot bigger because LaTeX is huge, uh, but it does allow you to produce PDF documents. This one is the one we're going to use for now, mainly because it's a bit easier. Uh, uh, so let's take a look at the usage instructions and see what we're up against. Uh, we've got... Mm, okay, docker run. So path to the documents. That's no problem. Uh, Sphinx dot Sphinx. Okay. Uh, so this just runs quick start and I assume...
Uh, okay, so to build, blah, 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 make HTML. So basically, okay, so it's, it's very simple. Uh, all it's going to do is take whatever we put into our documents directory and run it as if Sphinx was on our machine, which is super cool. Um, and they've even provided us with instructions when we want to add our own stuff in, which we are going to, because we're going to add some extensions and things. Kenny, you're going to you're going to upset me soon. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we're going to ex install some extensions, and so we're going to need to follow these instructions here. Um, but for now, uh, all we're going to do is we're going to uh, just follow these instructions and do some setup. So let's uh, let's keep everything nice and neat. So we'll keep make directory. Let's call it Scratch, and we'll go into Scratch. Okay, and then all we're going to do is follow their instructions quite precisely. Uh, in fact, we don't actually need to be in Scratch to do this. Uh, mm. uh, Oh, come on. Oh, have I not activated? Okay, so uh, we have to be a bit careful because, of course, this path is here. Now, we could use dot or we could use um, the current working directory. Let's just try it with dot. Uh, and Boom, 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 boom. Now then, uh, team created volume is too short. Yeah, I thought so. I knew, I knew there was. I knew. I knew. I knew that this was going to happen. Uh, what we need to do is give it the full path. Uh, so which is risky if I don't put quotes around it, but there you go. Right. Okay, so separate source and build directories. Um, yes. Uh, and I'll... Uh, there's a good reason for doing that because later on down the road we're going to want our build process to have a distinction between the inputs and the outputs and this is the quickest and easiest way of doing it uh let's call it uh, test or mm. which is a terrible name for a project um, uh Project release, uh, we won't have one. Language, English, and boom. And now we've got our system. Now then, <clears throat> the thing you have to remember, or we, we'll have to bear in mind, is that we can't just run make. <laughs> okay, because if we run make, uh, we don't have Sphinx installed. It's, it's actually all in that uh, Docker, okay? So what we have to do is we have to do something like make uh, HTML, which is the default, but OK. And now what we've got is uh, new tree. Uh, what? I haven't installed tree. Ooh, I should add that to my standard packages, I suppose. Uh, uh, now, you see, this is where you start to get naughty stuff, okay? Uh, because this is a vagrant system and therefore a developer environment, um, 
you know, doing a sudo apt install tree, not a big deal. Uh, if I'm going to use it a lot, and I do, uh, what I really ought to do is add it into my Vagrant file. Uh, no, I shouldn't. I'm an idiot. I should add it into the script. Uh, standard packages. Okay. And I should add tree on there. Okay, and if I were not lazy, I would jump out of this and I would run the provisioning again, but I am lazy. Right. So now we can see the HTML that's being produced. Okay. So the next challenge we've got is that we can't see this. Uh, I mean, we can view it, we can look at it, we can we can cut it out, and we can do via on it and things like that. Uh, but we don't have a web server, and even if we did, we don't have a web browser because this is a server. You know, it doesn't have a graphical user interface, so we don't have a browser or anything on it. So. If we want to see this, there are two ways of doing it. Okay, there's the easy way and the hard way. Uh, and actually, neither of them are particularly hard. Okay, so one way of doing it would be to run a web server on here, okay, and serve it up like we do with our concourse on a port for the VM. And we could port that forward out. Port that forward out that port out okay so that we could view it in in exactly the same way as we do with this concourse dashboard okay so this uh, concourse dashboard is uh, being served up from this virtual machine so we could we could arrange this make the same arrangement with a web server or we could just run the web server um uh, sorry or we could just copy these files into slash vagrant and then they're available on the uh on the host and we can run our web server on the host uh or we could just access it directly so if we just do um uh, i suppose we should copy it really okay we could copy the whole the whole of build down to Vagrant. Ah, and we could do it with minus R because then it would actually bloody work. Uh, okay. And now on my host machine, I can just open that up. Uh, so, oops, that didn't look very promising. Uh, okay, let's try it. Uh, okay. Uh, where are you? Salty vagrant. Come on. Why aren't you in my shortcuts? Uh, sometimes I hate this thing. Uh, no, let's just do it the, the long way around. I should have just done this in the first place. I'm not entirely sure uh, if this will work. Um, Slash build index dot html. Nope, couldn't be accessed. Why not? Because it's actually build html index. Ah. And 
Ta-da! Okay. Now, assuming these are all relative links. Okay. Nope, they're not. Oh, they are. There's just no modules. Duh. Anyway, yes, so we've not actually documented anything yet, so it's a pretty sparse fight site. So, um, <clears throat> but the point is it works, and that's kind of like the easy way of doing it, is just to access the files directly on Vagrant. In fact, we could just get it to build directly into Vagrant, but we're not going to, because uh, that's cheating. Uh, what we are going to do is, when we set up our pipeline, um, we will uh, also set up um, a target environment for it to go into. Uh, but we'll we'll get to that because it will be a good good thing to try. Okay. Okay. So that is. Uh, that, that's the setup uh, for our build. Now, what we now want to do is do m some of what we just did, in particular the make HTML. Uh, we don't want to do the quick start because the quick start is something you only do when you first construct your thing. So it's not part of the build process as such. Um, the build process is that last command. It's just the make HTML. Uh, okay, so it's just that. Uh, and in actual fact, the only bit that is the command is that. Uh, and in actual fact, that is the command. Oops. Okay, so make HTML is the command that we want to run. Okay, everything else is... Uh, is just docker noise okay so if we go to docker uh, ps and oh, of course it's not running because it, it's run and remove uh, yeah okay because we've got this remove flag on as soon as this finishes running it gets removed which is fine don't have a problem with that because uh, it's transient, um, but it's just a pain because I can't. But I, I, I suppose I can show you the dead ones, can't I? Because uh, you can do Docker PS A uh, and no, nope, because it was removed, not stopped. Mark. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I suppose uh, when that make exits it should just stop the docker instance so if we just take that remove off we can see the dead one ah no that's too much i can't be bothered doing that um what we are going to do though is we're going to start thinking about how we're going to organize our concourse okay If you want to investigate concourse, and I've got I've got to say this about concourse, the one downside to concourse, the one thing that will, if you're like me, it messed it messed with my head long enough. Okay, uh, is they've got very strange terminology. Um, you know, they talk about, for example, their command line interface is called Fly. And the reason is because, like so many Unix tools, concourse is a joke, as in it's an airport concourse. Okay, so you find that they have terminology in here that talks about um, baggage claim and you know various other things. So um, here we go. Yeah, you've got TSA. ATC, uh, baggage claim, uh, beacon, I guess that's to do with airports, garden, bit of a weak one that, uh, 
Reaper again, a bit weak. But you can see, yeah, you know, that they got all these terms. I guess they sounded funny at the time, but it just bakes your noodle, you know, when he's trying to figure out what's going on. Fortunately, actually, this is this is new to me. I never found this when I was first learning concourse, so this is actually quite good. And it shows you what's going on. Okay, so down here, a think of a worker as um, the, the it's the unit that is deployed onto a virtual machine. Okay, so it, in this instance, it's all happening locally because it's all running within that Docker image. But on a proper concourse deployment, uh, this would be on one machine. These workers would be on whichever host environment you needed to run in. Okay, so you could have one go to Red Hat, you could have one go to a Ubuntu, you could have another one go to Debian, and you could say, well, okay, I want to test my system on you know, Red Hat, Ubuntu and Debian. So I, I deploy workers to all those machines. I can then tell my build sister that the, the pipeline, I want you to execute on these three different environments. Or you can say, okay, part of my system is going to run on, I don't know, Debian front end servers. Okay, so I will deploy the front end worker onto Debian so that it can build in the correct environment. Okay, but I will build, I don't know, the back end on Red Hat, you know, as a as a secure uh secure Linux or something like that. You get the general idea. Workers are using the kernel that is appropriate for them. Uh, they're not necessarily the target environment though because when you run it, when you run deployments you're going to be deploying into somewhere that doesn't necessarily have a worker on it uh, so um, you know you'll be using things like uh, ssh or rsync or whatever deployment method you choose uh, you know uh, knocking it out into kubernetes or whatever um and it doesn't really matter where the worker runs as long as the tools will run okay on that environment. Uh, so, yes, um, all of this stuff uh, is really uh, the management system up here, TSA, uh, and ATC is just the bit that does the presentation of this uh, web interface plus uh, it's doing things like making sure that the pipeline gets run appropriately this stuff down here is all just about managing these the containers and the work and the volumes okay and as i said before containers basically each task in your pipeline runs in a container basically and the volumes are just used to pass and preserve information between the steps in the pipeline. Okay, and you can see here that garden and baggage claim divide up the job of managing your containers and volumes. So think of them as the garbage collectors. Um, they're not quite more or less uh, so they coordinate for example the baggage claim coordinates the passing around of the volumes with all of the artifacts and sources and so on and the containers uh, that are the tasks are looked after by the garden subsystem anyway that's probably more than we need to know right now okay we are going to almost exclusively use fly uh, to do our work uh, this web interface is as far as i'm concerned basically just pretty pictures um, it I, I suppose it makes things a bit easier uh, so if you uh, this, is, this is actually oops uh, uh, 
This is, this is actually the one that generates my website. I showed you it last week, I think. Okay, so this is the pipeline that generates the website. It runs in an environment very similar to what we've got set up. Uh, hello, why did that log out? Okay, so this interface does make this bit of it a bit easier. Yeah, because you can look at the history of your builds. Uh, you can see, for example, what was fetched from your Git instances. Uh, you can see, whoops, um, you can see, so th these are the resources. Uh, then you've got, uh, there we go, a task. So this is the thing that builds the website. Uh, and you can see it just uses Jekyll as a static site generator which builds the final website. And then this put is what deploys it into uh, the actual uh, production web server. And that all happens magically whenever it rebuilds the books of the articles for the website. Okay, so this is the articles. So it gets the articles uh, sources. These are uh, uh, the artifacts that were generated for the last build. Just makes it slightly more efficient. And then whoop, these are the builds that, that run. And they are quite long okay so they're just literally just the log output of the build so yeah this web interface makes that bit easier to review uh, I'll give it that but all, all of the setup and monitoring and uh, you know stopping and starting it and things like that uh, the fly interface is where we're going to be at and that also means that we can automate uh, the setup of our system. So, um, uh, I, no, I tried to show you this last week and it was an unmitigated pain in the arse. Um, no, let's just work through it. Okay, so one thing you will notice about these pipelines, uh, at least you will when I find it again. Here we go. Okay, so you can see here, um, that there are a whole load of resources. These are the black boxes and tasks, which are the green boxes. Okay, and um, nope, I've lost my train of thought. Yes, okay, so a pipeline uh, consists of jobs and jobs consist of uh, a series of tasks and it defines the relationships between those tasks uh, so if i go to uh, projects this is probably the easiest way of showing you the setup uh, do, 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 do. No, that was something else. Uh, not dot build, not dev, not CICD. Come on, Mark. Uh, here we go. Okay, so this is the CI system, and you can see it's divided up into pipelines, tasks and scripts you can ignore this this is just the latex part the bit we're interested in for concourse is pipelines tasks and scripts so pipelines this is a pipeline definition file and it's what you use to effectively load in your build to concourse uh, right, well, I skip the first bit and we'll just 
start talking about these, which are the resources. So we have a resource named website. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's probably a bad one to start with. Let's choose. Oh, I tell you what, let's have a look at. Okay. So we've got these resources. Okay. One of which is. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me see. Images. Okay. Images dash git is the source for the images. Okay. So if I go here and I look for images git. Here we go. So this is the definition of this resource. Okay, so we tell it what type it is. It's a git. It's a git resource. Uh, here, I've explicitly told it to put a GitLab icon on, which just means that thing there. Uh, nothing. Nothing very special. Uh, the git icon on the left. Um, and then this is the important part. We tell it where to get the sources from. So it goes to the GitLab repository. So you can guess from that it's going to do a clone. And now I want to be able to say which branch to use. Well, as it happens, I'm now using trunk based development. So that never changes nowadays. But branch, I used to use a dev and and uh, I used to use a sort of, uh, uh, did I call it dev or staging? I think I called it staging. Uh, so I, I used to get it all generated and deploy it to a staging website. Now I don't bother. I just check it all out locally and then just push it straight up to the main site. So this branch is always now master or using the new parlance main, I suppose. And this allows me to have the secret, which is my Git repository key, the private key for my repository, uh, passed in as the private key for the pipeline to use. OK, because that's a private repository. So Git can now do the clone using this setup. OK, and that's exactly what this does. This just tells this how to get that resource. OK. And that resource is made available inside this task. So if we just go and look at the task, which is further down. OK, so you can see we define all our resources at the beginning. And then we use them in this job de jobs definition. OK, so we've got. The images job. Consists of a plan to run these tasks in sequence, OK? Well, actually, it's going to do them in. Uh, it's going to do. It's going to run the task in sequence. This in parallel just says get all the resources in parallel. It's a time saver. Trigger means that it's going to poll, uh, I think, by default, once a minute. So basically, it will check this repository once every minute to see if there's been any commit. If there has, then that will cause that to update that, that, that particular repository. So images dash git. If that updates, then that will cause the rest of this, th this plan to run. OK, same with if I change the CI git, which is the one that contains this uh, continuous integration system then that will also cause a build. Uh, if I change anything in this latex packages git, which is actually, it contains all of the style definitions and stuff like that for latex. You don't need to worry about it. OK, but this image build, which is really just a convenience, it just stores the last set of images that were created. And it means that when I run the build, I can check the dates and see whether or not I need to rebuild each every image, and I I can then limit the builds the the, the images 
artifacts that are rebuilt, you'll notice that that doesn't have trigger on it. Okay, and by default, this now becomes non-triggered. So on here, you can see this has a dotted line. Okay, and dotted line means, yes, this resource is used, but do not trigger a build if this thing changes. You'll notice on this one, on books, it is triggered. It's solid line. And that's because if I rebuild the images, I then want to run the rebuild of the books and the articles. Okay, in order to make sure that they get rebuilt. Right, onwards and upwards. So the first thing it does is run this task images SVG. Okay, so within this images job here, you'll see you've got the images SVG task. Okay, and you see what happens there. It just runs through and checks whether it needs to rebuild. And if it does, it rebuilds that particular image. Okay, so that's the job, as it were. And that job is defined in the CI git tasks image build .yaml. Okay, so we break out the tasks into their own definition files. So uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a second. This tells me that we're, we're mapping. Okay, so we're mapping from... Jim. Uh, we're mapping from the images git file uh, to images sources. So inside the container, there will be a directory called images source. And that will contain whatever the images git resource provides. In this case, a clone of that repository. Okay, the CI directory will contain whatever the CI git resource returns, and so on. And the output mapping says, take uh, <laughs> take the directory images, which is actually also an input, but that will be the one that contains the actual SVG images, okay? And map that to the build images uh, output, which will is down a bit later, okay? Then we have this reconcile step, okay? And the reconcile step takes images build image, Okay, the one we've just set up, okay, and maps it to build images. Alongside taking also the images get images build zone. And again, it's just making these available inside the container using these directories. Okay, and it then maps the output back to the images build resource, which is, if you remember, the Git repository that contains the artifacts. Okay, so the long and the short of it is that all of this just describes oops, okay, everything going on around this box here. Okay, so we've got all of these inputs coming in. Inside here are a series of tasks that take these in and produce this as output. And within here is just the, this description here. All right? Now, you'll notice the task itself is defined in a different file. And this is just decomposition. It doesn't have to be. You can actually put everything from this file directly into this pipeline. You can imagine this is a very simple pipeline. For a complicated one, it would become an absolute nightmare. Okay, so we don't, we break it out. 
So to break it out, we go into tasks, and you see here uh, image build YAML, which is the one that we were just talking about. And this tells the pipeline what to run and where to run it. So the first thing it says is, I need a worker that is running on Linux. Okay, and that is, if you remember, uh, do I still have it open? Um, no, I don't. Uh, yeah, you remember these workers? And I said that they would run on different platforms. That's what this does. This is the selector. This basically says run on a Linux worker. In this case, it doesn't matter. They're all Linux because they're all running on the same VM. Then it says, OK. Uh, now, uh, what's the best way of doing it? OK, so let's um, let's first of all uh, ignore this for a second. Um, let's deal with the inputs and the outputs. This just says I am expecting certain inputs. I'm expecting an image source, a CI, a latex package and an image. But this is these two are optional. OK. Remember this name, image source. Let's, let's um, rather than keep jumping backwards and forwards like that. Right. So when we were looking at in here, uh, resources, jobs, come on, right. Image, books, articles, images. Here we go. So remember here, we were talking about the input mapping. Okay. And we said inside the container, there'll be a directory called image source. This is where that directory is defined. OK, so we're expecting an input source. We're expecting a CI. We're expecting a LaTeX package. But because we can't necessarily, when we define a task, we can't necessarily uh, predict what the upstream directories are going to be called. Uh, concourse provides this mapping process where we can say, OK, inside the task, it's called image source, but outside it'll be called image git because it's a resource. OK. And the same thing goes for the outputs. Yeah, the outputs are called images which is the same as this input. In fact, it is exactly the same directory in this instance. Uh, you can see here that I've specified that the branch is master directly. And the important bit is it runs this script. OK, so this is the bit that actually does the heavy lifting. This is the bit that actually does work. All of this is just setting up the container. What? Uh, this uh, actually, that's interesting. Because that's not actually being used. Interesting. Yeah, I obviously changed it at some point. Doesn't matter. Irrelevant. Let's have a look at the script. That's just me being untidy. So if we look in scripts, OK, there are all of these uh, these scripts uh, and build images. It's just a bash script. OK, and it does. It just goes through and builds a script. Uh, one of the things it does is it just checks. Because what are you doing? Going to go out. Yeah, OK, I'll finish up in a minute, mate, and we can go out. OK, so the bit that matters is that down there, OK, which basically says build the images from the source directory into the build directory. And then 
It's just a standard script, okay? And all, all it does is, in this instance, is because there's no good make system for this particular approach, uh, what it does is it just calculates the dates and says, uh, you know, do I need to rebuild it or not? Uh, it also, uh, if I remember correctly, it also builds the images into specific directories. OK, so this is just saying uh, based on the name of the image file, OK, build it into a particular location. Uh, and that's just an organizational thing for later. Uh, so if I go to, uh, uh, actually, if I duplicate it again. Uh, and instead of being in CI, if I go to uh, build intermediates and we look at images. OK, so this this is the this is the images build repository. OK, and it just sets them out based on date It takes this bit of the name. OK, and it just makes them easier to store and find. Uh, and refer to in, for example, the documents and so on. So rather than having to remember, you know, rather than have to search through loads of directories, you can actually just refer to fairly short paths. What's the matter? You need to go out. You see, now you're being boring. I'm sorry. Uh, right. Okay. Um, it's 10 o'clock. We've been going for about three hours. I'm going to have to call it a night, I think. Yeah, you can get down. You're getting antsy. Go on. Go on. Go on. Uh, right. Sorry, guys. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cut and run. I think I think the dog needs to be let out. And I think three hours, my voice is gonna start to give out. Hopefully, that has given you a flavour of what we're going to be doing. Okay. So next time. And I'm, uh, I don't know, if people are interested, I might try and do two a week. Uh, so maybe Tuesday and Thursday. I know I said last time I was going to try and do um, the Tuesday session, do it via Zoom, uh, so that we could back and forth. I don't know if anybody's interested in doing that, to be honest. If you're interested in a Zoom on Tuesday then let me know by email, okay? Uh, or, or, uh, or through Reddit, or, yeah, they're the two that are likely to read. Failing that, uh, I might schedule one for Tuesday, uh, a, a, another stream, and another one for Thursday, because otherwise this is going to be too slow for most people. Uh, you know, you, you guys are going to go off and learn stuff and doing this once a week. Uh, we can only cover so much, even if I don't make a mistake. OK. Um, anything else uh, I can think of before we go? OK. No, I think it's been a fairly good day. Uh, we've done a bit of refactoring. We wasted a bit of time because of the weirdness going on with the certificates. No idea what was going on there. However, I don't think it's an issue. Um, we've looked at uh, the, the, the key thing, I think, today is that we've looked at these Docker commands for setting up and running Sphinx. And these are precisely the things we're going to put into our scripts when we set up our tasks. OK. Um, so we'll we'll look at that next week uh, and we'll set up a very simple thing that basically does what we did today. Uh, but instead of using Sphinx Quick Start, uh, we will use Git and we'll will actually pull from a Git repository and push it through this Sphinx make and produce some output and then take that output and serve it up somewhere. Uh, and we'll see how we get on. Uh, 
once we've done that, which basically is the core idea behind all of this stuff, we'll then step it up a notch. Uh, we'll start using some secrets and how we get those into the build system. Uh, we'll see how developers can use the same pipeline and how they can change stuff in and out uh, to, to do their own localized stuff, but using the same build system. Um, we'll see how uh, we can then go on to do a proper deployment to a real website. So we'll, we'll, we'll then talk about setting up you know, um, a web server on a on a cloud box, uh, a VM in the cloud. We'll we'll do it with a VM. We won't we won't try and be too clever and and use any sort of AWS or Azure stuff. We we'll do with containers. We'll 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 set up our own server uh, and set up a very simple nginx, uh, and we'll we'll just deploy to that and have a look uh, then we can start building out more and more sophisticated um, builds so for example we can look at how sphinx has got rudimentary testing stuff in uh, in order to test the broken links and things uh, and do spell checking which if you like me is essential um yeah so we can just start incrementally building on this okay then we can start writing the documentation to document what we've just done and we'll use sphinx to do that okay so we we're kind of bootstrapping our documentation so we'll start writing some documentation into the scripts i mean the scripts we've done are pretty self-evident but there are a couple of things in there that might bear a comment or two that would could go into documentation um, and we can certainly write documentation to describe our pipeline um, because although they're simple ones like this are relatively straightforward to read through um, it's worth uh, it's worth still documenting them uh, similarly uh, these scripts uh, can get quite gnarly. This this one's fairly straightforward. Uh, this one, I think it's this one. Actually, it might be it might it might be that this one's yeah. This one's not too bad. Uh, th this stuff get got a bit complicated. Uh, yeah, so that one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, yeah, no, none of them are particularly bad. Although I have to say, one of them at least needs to be rewritten. Uh, this is an orc file, if anybody knows that. Uh, which, um, no, no, I'm not going to get into that. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll resist the temptation. Uh, but we can we can document these, okay? Because uh, uh, although I don't think they're particularly unclear, they're they're reasonably well written, even though they are just for me. Um, I do still try to stick to the principles of you know using good variable names and making things obvious. Um, but even so, uh, you know, documentation, documentation. Uh, just before we go. Let's just think about this. There are two, principally, there are two forms of documentation that we're interested in. Uh, there's long form documentation. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, describes your processes and procedures and uh, describes your architecture and the general approach. Uh, it used to be the case that you would include requirements in there. I'm going to make a case that, in actual fact, you're better off uh, writing your requirements as tests and then generating documentation 
i.e. requirements documents, from those tests. And we'll see about doing that at some point in the future as well. We'll use, we'll use InfraTest, uh, sorry, Test Infra and PyTest to put some tests together. Uh, and we'll see how you, we can use the system we, we're putting together now with Sphinx to actually mash those to produce nice PDFs or HTML websites that your customers can then read as requirements documents and provide feedback on and the reasons why we would do that. Then, uh, so, so that kind of is a halfway house in documentation. So there are three types of documentation. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Um, the third type is the type that I think most developers hate writing, and that is code documentation. And you will see people make the case that code should be readable. As in, uh, you know, you should be able to just look at the code and figure out what's going on. I call bullshit on that. Um, yes, you should make every effort to make your code as readable as you can. No question. And readable code tends to have less bugs in it uh, because it's more obvious what's going on. Uh, people tend to not be as clever in readable code okay i've seen i've seen some absolute nightmare code and it's all been because people have tried to do too much in one statement for example uh you know and you it just makes it difficult to parse and understand what it's doing it's much better to expand it all out and make it obvious what's going on uh believe me 99 percent of the time Compilers, modern compilers, are better than you at figuring out how to optimize your code. And optimization should be one of the last steps in your process. Write it to be clear. If it doesn't do what you need it to do in a timely fashion, optimize that. And in actual fact, this is a good case in point, okay? Because this originally... Uh, the, these 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 scripts were incredibly simple. They just used basically they just used LaTeX Make to actually do the build. Uh, and in actual fact, uh, blah, 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 blah. text to PDF of course is in the library. Um, so text to PDF uh, just basically calls this LaTeX Make, which is a Make system for LaTeX. Um, and that was really all it did. And it was only when that started to take too long to build because it was rebuilding every document. Like I said, LaTeX is not the swiftest thing in the world at the best of times, um, that I ended up having to write all this scaffolding around it. Okay, so that is optimization as a result of something running slowly. Uh, if I'd started out optimizing it, that would have potentially been a complete waste of time and B, could have made things much more complicated than I needed to. So, yes, there's that. Uh, that's got slightly off topic. Documentation. Yes, so readable documents, definitely a, a plus. But there are certain things that the code can't say. For example... The code can't really describe why something is written the way it is. Okay, if you go to a piece of code, and this happens regular as clockwork, if you go to a piece of code and you look at it, and you, you think to yourself, why didn't they just X? Okay, and again, case in point, somebody comes and look at this and goes, why don't you just use LaTeX Make? I mean, it does the job. And the answer is yes, it does, but it doesn't. It's not efficient. So all of this scaffolding would bear a, an explanation about why I put all the work into writing the scaffolding. Uh, so that can't be captured in the code itself. You have to put a comment in there somewhere. Um, you know, whether it's in a commit statement or whether it's in the code, I, I say put it in the code. 
because uh, that's what people are going to read. Okay, people are going to look at the code, and if there's a comment that says, the reason I've done it this apparently unobvious way is because X, Y, Z. Uh, that way, a developer coming along later doesn't look at your code, and by developer, I mean developer, maintainer of scripts, maintainer of build system, and so on, doesn't come along and think to themselves, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll rewrite this because I know a better way of doing it. If you've already tried that way, they're just going to be wasting their time because they're going to change everything, discover it doesn't work the way it should, okay, and then end up having to put your stuff back. Yeah? Whereas you know, a two-line comment that said, the reason I've done it this way is because blah, 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 Problem solved. He will look at that and go, oh, okay. I understand now why you've done it this apparently weird way. So yes, so there's the three types of document: the long form, the intermediate, yeah, long form like your architecture documents and so on. Your intermediates in my world, which is your requirements, which are code in the sense that we're going to write the tests. And the tests then get translated back into pretty documents for people who don't write code to read. And in actual fact, if you're familiar with um, the, the Gherkin language, uh, requirements capture language, then that is kind of what we're after going the other way. Yep. We won't go there right now. We'll go there later. Um, and then you've got encode, yeah, the, the documentation, the code. And that, again... You've got the why, and you've also got API documentation. Now, Sphinx is quite cool because it can look at your um, the signatures of functions and things and generate a lot of the documentation boilerplate. But you still need to put in comment strings, you know, document strings that say this is what the function does in a broad sense. Yeah, this is its objective. Uh, you don't need to describe every single line of code. You just need to say, you know, oh, this this adds two integer values together and produces you know, a float or whatever. Um, you don't need to write a massive amount of documentation. In fact, the less documentation, the better. There's an old adage. Uh, I can't remember who coined it. Uh, but basically... Uh, it was it was a was it an architect or was it a typesetter? I can't remember now. But basically the adage goes like this good design is not when you've added all the features you can. Good design is when you've taken away as many features as you can and still have something that does the job it should. Okay? So in documentation terms, that means Write the least amount of documentation you can in order to disambiguate and clarify what your system or your code does. And on that cheery note, I'm going to call it the evening. And I'm happy to report that three hours and 17 minutes in, the microphone hasn't cut out. So I evidently have fixed the problem I had with the microphone. Right. Thanks, guys. Um, I appreciate your attention. Uh, it's nice to know I'm not shouting into the void. Um, and, uh, yeah, I will, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll do the usual thing. I'll put this up as video on demand, hopefully a bit quicker this time. I'll put this up as video on demand uh, on the YouTube channel so you can review it and you know, play it back at 400 times speed or whatever. Um, I'll fill in the details on Reddit and post the next session on Reddit. Uh, if you're interested in a Tuesday session, let me know via Reddit or by email. Uh, all the details are on the website. Um, that I think is actually also... Uh, it, it will be linked to from the Reddit page anyway. But yeah, you can you can get hold of me, uh, all all the contact details and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And on that note, I'm going to go and get a glass of water, let the dog out, 
Where, where did he go? Oh, he's obviously got... But, oh, there you are. I knew you were around somewhere. I'm going to hear you scratch him. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to call it a night. Next time, like I said, we'll pick up where we left off and uh, we'll start building the pipeline proper. Come on in.